Bonnie. And 20 years ago, when she was quite young, and I was too, we were both just kids, weren't we? Um, and I got to know her mother because her mother taught me the names of the trees in Chile. And she was incredibly patient with me um, because I didn't speak any Spanish at all. And so she waited till I looked up every word in the dictionary. <laughs> Have you ever done that, sitting with someone who doesn't speak your language and just had that kind of patience? Um, she was an amazing woman, and I met her grandmother, and her grandmother was a cook in the camp and made beautiful food, um, but just really interacted with us like she was a, all the grandmother of all of us. Um, and then I watched Maito grow um, and do her work, um, and first in Chile at Central Shalom and working in the camp there. And then she was called as a missionary to Nicaragua. So she was sent from Chile to Nicaragua as a missionary. And she is going to tell you a little bit about what her work is. But first, primero, quiero dar un pequeño regalo. I want to give her a, just a small gift because she has a lot of luggage and not much room. No mucho espacio. Um, from the congregation made by uh, one of the ladies of the church, and just as a token of our love and affection. So there you are, my dog. Thank you. So um, we give it with great love and affection. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, Maito does speak English, but you know, it's intimidating to speak a different language in a microphone. So she's going to share with you in Spanish, and I'm going to do the best I can to translate it. And if I don't know what she's saying, I'll just make something up. Durante mis cuatro años de servicio en Nicaragua, 
during my four years of service in Nicaragua, estuve trabajando en dos lugares distintos. I was working in two distinct places. La Iglesia Misión Cristiana, the Mission Christian Church, y el CIETS. And in an organization called CIETS, which is an ecumenical organization that does theological and social work with the community. Con la Misión Cristiana, trabajé apoyando a los jóvenes de la iglesia en dos temas. When I was working with the Christian Mission Church, I worked with the youth in two different ways. En el cuidado del medio ambiente, I helped them to understand how to take care of the environment. Y en mediación juvenil, ambos programas que fueron desarrollados por el Centro Shalom de la Iglesia Pentecostal de Chile. And I taught them a program called uh, Mediation for Youth, which were developed by Centro Shalom in Chile. And the mediation program was also developed through the Brookfield Institute. And so I worked with Centro Shalom to develop the mediation program, and now it has gone to Nicaragua. Y también con la Misión Cristiana, estuve apoyando en el proyecto de biodigestores. So this is a really interesting project. You can see what she's circling there. It's called a bio digestores. Digestores, biodigestores. It's basically um, a plastic container where they put the feces of the cow and it emits gas and they use the gas to heat their homes. And so it's, I mean, they don't have trees. They were deforested in that area and they're all farmers. So it's a way that they can get heat Um, that uses everything they have. Gracias, Maite. Ahí hay imágenes de los niños de la iglesia. Esa es la misión cristiana, la iglesia misión cristiana. Y ellos tienen un proyecto escolar para atender a los niños eh, luego de la escuela. This is what the children did in the schools, and this is the Mission Christian Church. So you can see some of the projects that they worked on in the church. Los siguientes dos años, trabajando con CIETS, apoyé en las áreas que el centro trabaja. Um, I worked for the next two years with CIETS, the organization that's ecumenical and works in theological work and social work. And I worked in those two different areas with them. And you can see my ito. El área teológica y el área de desarrollo social. So to develop them socially and also um, to consider the theology. Ahí estamos cosechando maíz. We are harvesting corn right con, there. Con una técnica que les voy a contar de qué se trata. And with a method that I'll talk a little bit about. Con el área de desarrollo social, trabajé principalmente con la, los agricultores. I worked primarily with the farmers apoyándoles en capacitación acerca de buena nutrición, so I taught them more about good nutrition, cosecha de agua de lluvia, conserving the water from the rain, cultivar la tierra sin químicos, and organic uh, growing, mejorando el suelo, improving the soil, diversificando los cultivos, and diversifying the crops. Y ayudándoles a comprender los cambios del clima. I help them to understand the impact of climate change. Y cómo poder adaptarse a este. And how to adapt to it. Some methods to adapt to the climate change that was already happening. Ahí estamos en el área teológica apoyando en distintas relaciones ecuménicas de Nicaragua. So um, this is in the area of theology and There are ecumenical groups that come together um, for in this organization. La, la anterior ahí. Colaboré con la red ACT, una red para desastres, para atender los desastres. Uh, so they created um, a connection for um, helping with disasters. Una imagen de asesoría técnica para cultivar eh, otros cultivos que no sean frijoles. Um, so other ways, other specific techniques for cultivating beans. Fue las cebollas, el cultivo de and, cebollas. And onions. Y que ayudó mucho a la familia a tener otra entrada de dinero. 
And I help the families how, uh, create other ways to earn money. Celebraciones en el equipo de trabajo. And the, the team was celebrating many things like birthdays and different occasions. You can see Mayito there leading that. Gira de intercambio de conocimiento. And exchanging information, opportunities to learn from other people in the community. Apoyando a las comunidades cafetaleras que cosechan café. They're uh, harvesting coffee. And so she's creating ways to conserve the water when they harvest coffee. El apoyo en la nutrición. And the supporting them in nutrition, good nutrition. Elaborando abonos orgánicos. And um, a lab, oh, and organic methods for growing. There are some pictures about that. Ahí están las cebollas de Doña Marta. <laughs> and there's the onions, yes. and that's Marta. Ella logró onion. cosechar tres mil cebollas. She grew um, three thousand onions from that. <laughs> y ese era el salón de clase que yo tenía. And there's the classrooms where I was. <laughs> Diferentes actividades con el grupo teológico. Uh, activities in the theological group. Ahí está otra de mis salas de clases. <laughs> And other classrooms of people. <laughs> otra de las salas de clases. <laughs> And this is alimentos saludables. Saludables. Uh, healthy ways to eat. La importancia de los colores de los vegetales. To notice the different colors when you're eating and notice the different colors of vegetables and to try to uh, integrate different colors into your food. Porque siempre es el blanco y el rojo, maíz y frijol en el plato. Yes, in Nicaragua, um, Mayito has told me they eat beans and uh, tortillas for just about every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yes. Y acompañar a las visitas de Estados Unidos que visitaban Nicaragua. Otra, And otro de mis trabajos. She received delegations from the United States. This one is from Iowa, right? Yes. Yes. Last. Sorry. Yes. Eso es. Ah. Me siento muy agradecida. I am very grateful. De tener esta oportunidad de colaborar en la misión del reino de Dios. To collaborate with you in the kingdom of God. Y que su iglesia me haya apoyado a través de ministerios globales para lograrlo. And when you support global ministries, the mission of the church, we have been supporting Maito in this incredible work in Nicaragua. So Maito, we're mm -hmm. grateful for your sacrifice and we're grateful that global ministries allows us to be in places mm -hmm. that we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. <laughs> The first reading this morning is from Deuteronomy, and it's chapter 34, verses 1 through 12. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pigsah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead, as far as Dan, all Nap Napal, Napoli, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as, <clears throat> as far as the Western Sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoah. And the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I will give it to your, to your descendants and I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he, and he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Poor, 
but no man knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. And then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded, had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and all the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great and terrible deeds which Moses wrought in the sight of Israel. The next reading is from Matthew, and these are on the screen, by the way. Um, Chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and observe whatever they tell, whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by men, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and the salutations in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have, you have one teacher, and you are all brethren. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called masters, for you have one master, the Christ. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humble, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. God bless these holy words. Humility and the basin and pitcher are here to remind us of how Jesus washed the feet of disciples to show his humility, um, even though he was the Son of God. Um, And Uh, Pope John XXIII was known very well for being a humble man, and someone is said to have spoken to him and said, you know, Pope, you are really fat. And he responded, well, the conclave that elected me wasn't a beauty pageant, so (laughs) that's not what I'm here for. Um, The Bible dictionary of ver, uh, definition of humility is freedom from pride or arrogance. And I think the scripture definition of humility is, but the one who's greatest will be your servant, and everyone who lifts themselves up will be brought low, but those who make themselves low will be lifted up. So that in some way, you know, when we humble ourselves to each other and to God, we will be lifted up. Um, Julius Lester, in a novel that he wrote, said, eating grits and fat back for breakfast and washing up every morning in cold water from a hydrant in the backyard helped one learn humility and humanity. And he said, it was a great lesson in my life. Um, And another way that we think of humility is um, when we look out at the sky and we experience how enormous the universe is And we realize that we're bits of dust in this spectacle that, as Edwin Dobbs says, scope beggars the imagination whose secrets make a mockery of reason 
So when we look out into the universe, we're so humbled by all of the things that we don't know. And we have a sense of all that we can learn in the world. And that's part of what humility is, is always being open to learning from another person and realizing that we all have something to teach each other. In The Economist, it said, um, if leadership has a secret sauce, it may be humility. A humble boss understands that there are things he or she doesn't know. They listen not only to the other bigwigs, but also to the kind of people who don't get invited to the extravagant dinners. So even the economist realizes there is a need for humility. But I think for us, as I was considering what I was going to say in this sermon and also that it was All Saints Day, I realized that we've learned so much from those who have gone before us. So I just wanted you to look at their faces and remember Cindy Harris, and you know how she hated to get credit for anything, even though she was the one that started the community meal, and it has become just an amazing event. Um, over 100 people on Friday night with so many people helping out. And um, if you went to talk to Cindy, even when she was feeling terrible, she didn't want to talk about herself. She always wanted to hear about what you were doing. And the next time you came, she would remember what you said the last time, and she'd always ask about it. Or we think of Martha Gidney. Now, um, many of you didn't know Martha as well as Darlene did, but she is such an example of humility. She always had a smile on her face every time you went to see her, and she was always working hard for others. She was busy doing things all the time. She never stopped, and taking care of her family, and sometimes it was going out to work to take care of the family, and sometimes it was staying home and caring for them by cooking and cleaning and doing things around the house, so we remember Martha. Um, Nancy Gray. Nancy Gray, um, she was an outspoken woman, and she was honest, and she would tell you what she thought. Um, she was also a nurse in pediatrics, and so her humility came from wanting the very best for every child she took care of and for expecting the best of other people and also expecting the best from the children that she took care of. We remember Nancy Gray, who was so active in church life, too. Bev Batchelder. She was the oldest member of the church. And uh, you may know that she couldn't take care of herself for quite a number of years. But if you went by to visit Beverly... Even if she didn't know who you were, you'd walk in, and she had a smile, and she'd be so glad to see you. Um, and she would talk to you, even though she couldn't quite find the words, and she would interact with you. Um, and she has done so much for the church over the many years that she was an active part of the life of the church. Judy Wirth, well... We didn't even know all the things Judy did around this church. I mean, she made this, she made that, she made this, she made those. I mean, you just walk into every room, and it has some expression of who Judy was. And she didn't really try to get a lot of acclamation for what she did. Um, she just noticed something and... She took care of it, and she took care of it in an incredible way. And when she knew that she didn't have long to live, um, she knew maybe a year and a half before she passed away that she was going to, she started trying to finish up all the projects. So she made more <laughs> extravagant and more beautiful costumes than she had ever made before so that we wouldn't need to have any new costumes for 20 more years. Um, she passed on the project of making the confirmation stoles. I just found out this past week. I didn't even know she had done that. Um, she gave me a book, and she had put on the front chilly memories. And so she said, now, I want you to put all the pictures of the relationship with our sister church in Chile in this book. 
And in so many ways, um, she not only did things around the church and never told anyone about it, but when she knew that it was her time to go, she made sure that the good work were, would continue. And you know what? If Judy asked you to do something, of course you were going to say yes because <laughs> it came from Judy. We remember Mark Hager. Now, if you talk to Mark, the first word that can, would come to your mind would not be humility because whenever Mark was in a room, we always knew he was there, right? We did. Um, but as I thought about Mark and what we've learned from him, I think that it was a kind of humility the way that he took the dreaded disease of cancer and let it be a learning opportunity for all of us. I mean, how many of you learned something from Mark when he talked to you about how he was doing and approaching life? Raise your hand. Do you think you learned? Yeah. I mean, everyone. And so taking that terrible thing and transforming it into something good, not just for himself, but for a lot of people, it's a beautiful thing. And Marion Sowen. Now, Marion always used to sit right there. And um, she hardly ever missed church. And even when she couldn't hear anything anymore in the service, you know, she would sit there quietly and smile through the service because being here was so important to her. And she was so good-natured and faithful um, and she really loved to laugh and had fun with life. Um, she never complained about her pain. She never complained when she was failing. She always tried to find something good to say or good to talk about when you would go and visit her. And, of course, everybody is wearing a piece of Marion's jewelry at one time or another over the year. Even the men, you know, she would try to get them. Humility is countercultural. You know, it's not really something that our world teaches us. It's something that we learn from Christ Jesus and that we commit ourselves to. It's a way we transform the world and a way we become closer to Almighty God. And I think today, on All Saints Day, when we're thinking about humility and we humble ourselves before eternity, we learn the, um, the new insight that is in the words of the hymn that we sang in the beginning, that we think of our loved ones who have gone on before us and we feebly struggle still, but we know the promise of God that they in glory shine. So we remember everything they taught us, and we remember it today. Amen. And now...